Hello and welcome to this live stream from the Museum of London. We should have schools and families joining us today, so I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Marina and I'll be your host for today. And joining us we have Meryl Jeter. And Meryl is a curator at the museum and our expert on the Great Fire of London. Hi everyone. Now we'll be having a little Q&A with Meryl later. So get thinking about some of the questions that you might want to ask her about why the Great Fire started. But before we get going, we have some important things to tell you. So firstly, this is the very first time that we're streaming live from our homes. So there might be a few hitches, a few technical hitches, so please do bear with us. Secondly, please make sure that you have an adult with you during the stream and encourage them to get involved as well. If you're watching via Facebook, please make sure that your profile has your preferred privacy settings before you comment. We aren't responsible for what is said in the comments, but we do encourage you to be very sensitive to others. And if you do comment on the stream, remember that the message and the account name will be visible to the, to the public. Now, adults, it's up to you to type in questions and remember not to share any personal information with us, including children's first names or photos of them. But we hope that you can hear and see us clearly. So do give us a like or a comment on Facebook to let us know that it's all working. Now, today is the first of our three part series looking at the Great Fire of London. Each day we'll be giving you a short tour through an exhibition that we made about it called Fire Fire with actions and activities that you can do together. The theme for your tour today is what started the fire and how did it spread? After your tour, we'll give you an extra three minutes of thinking time to talk to each other about what you've seen and heard and share any questions you have about it with us in the comments on Facebook. And then I will answer some of your questions live. Now, if we're lucky, we'll get lots of great questions from you all, so I won't have time to answer them all face to face, but we'll do our best to reply to you in the Facebook comments afterwards. And if you're really keen and looking for something fun to do afterwards, we'll even suggest an exciting activity to you, for you to do at the end. So what are we waiting for? Are you ready for that special tour? Then let's get started. My colleague Nina will show you around. Hello, Meryl. Hi, Nina. So can you tell us about what Curator does? So for this exhibition, I read a lot of books to find out what happened in the Great Fire. I chose the objects and helped to put the exhibition together. So today I'm going to be showing you around the exhibition so we can investigate the fire, what happened and how London changed. So this represents what London looked like before the Great Fire started? Yes, so this is a typical London street before the fire. So it's narrow, it's dark. The upper floors of the houses are leaning out into the street, which makes it narrower and easier for fires to spread. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Great Fire began on a narrow street like this called Pudding Lane. Yes. So if you come with me, I can show you how the fire started. The Great Fire started in Thomas Farriner's bakery on Pudding Lane at about one o'clock in the morning. We don't know exactly how the fire began, but we think maybe a spark from his oven set fire to some wood next to it. Mm -hmm. And then the family were woken up with the smoke coming up the stairs. So Thomas, his daughter Hannah, and their manservant escaped out of the window upstairs. Um, but their maid was too frightened to jump out. And so we think she was the first person to die in the fire. Mm. So this fire that just starts in a bakery ends up destroying a quarter of London in four days. Imagine that for a moment. Perhaps you'd like to act it out where you're sitting. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night to feel smoke in your face and, and hear the burning sounds. Imagine having to climb out of the window on the street to escape and then having to wake up your neighbours. Maybe you'd shout together, help! Fire! Help! Wake up! Wake up! Okay, let us go through now to see how the fire spread. 
So you can see the fire beginning in Pudding Lane on Sunday the 2nd of September. And there was this huge storm wind that was blowing in from the east which pushed the fire across the city. So you can see the direction that the fire is spreading across this map. This is Tuesday the 4th of September, which is the worst day of the fire. And this is when some of the most famous buildings are destroyed, like St Paul's Cathedral. So by the end of Tuesday, the fire was a mile and a half wide. So it would take you half an hour to walk from one side of it to the other. On Wednesday, the wind died down, and that's when people started to be able to finally get control of the fire. And then by the time the sun comes up, on Thursday morning, the fire is out, though some places actually smouldered for months afterwards. Why do you think the fire got so bad? I'm going to give you 30 seconds now to discuss this with someone next to you before Muriel tells you some of the reasons that we think are responsible. So let's see if you thought of a lot of the reasons that we have about why the fire got so bad. Well, here we have a symbol of the moon, and that's to show that the fire started in the middle of the night when most people were asleep, so there weren't enough people around to stop it right at the beginning. And here we have a picture of the sun, because the fire began at a time at the end of a long, hot summer, so London was really dry. Mm. And then this, we've got a picture of the wind, and that's because there was this huge storm wind blowing from the east that night, and it pushed the fire across oh, the yes. city. Yeah. And then down here we've got buildings, and that's because a lot of the houses in London were made from wood, and that burns easily. And also, lots of the houses were built very close together, so it was easy for the fire to spread from one house to the next. Yes, of course. <laughs> Well, we hope you enjoyed that. I certainly learned a lot. Now's your chance to have a good think and talk amongst yourselves about what you've seen and heard and to share any questions that you have for us on the Facebook comments. Can't wait to see what you come up with. Now, remember not to share any personal information, but if you're in school, do let us know the name of your school and your class. Focus on questions about what we're learning today. So how the fire sp started and why it spread. You've got three minutes to think and to share your questions on Facebook. Go.
Welcome back. We've had some amazing questions come through. So without further ado, let's get answering them. So our first question for you, Mariel, mm -hmm. comes from Sarah Smith. She says, could the fire have been started deliberately? Uh, well, that was one of the theories at the time. And in fact, they had an investigation after the fire to look at how it might have been started. And Thomas Fariner, the baker who owned the bakery where the fire began, always said that it was not his fault and the fire had been started deliberately. But actually, I mean, there was no solid evidence that the fire was started on purpose. So we think it was probably an accident. OK. And then um, Charlotte Walker asked, did the baker get into trouble for starting the fire? Well, maybe luckily for him, um, a Frenchman called Robert Hubert was arrested fleeing the country and confessed to starting the Great Fire, even though he probably had nothing to do with it whatsoever. Um, he seems to have been a little bit confused um, and uh, he was hanged for starting the Great Fire. But the investigation as to what caused the fire carried on after his death, actually. So he probably had absolutely nothing to do with it at all. But what it did mean for the baker was that um, he managed not to get into trouble. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, and talking about the bakery, Sarah asks what type of food they would have been making in the bakery. Um, well, uh, Thomas Mariner had a contract to make ship's biscuits for the Navy. So those are those kind of hard, salty biscuits that sailors have to eat on long voyages. Hmm. I didn't know that. Thank you, Mariel. Um, and what else have we got here? So um, Ali says, did they have a version of the fire service? There was no fire brigade in London in 1666. So if a fire started in your local area, you were supposed to get together with your neighbours to put it out. And they did have kind of communal firefighting equipment that was kept in churches and things like that. Um, but we're going to be talking much more about that next week when we, we um, our next stream will be about how they fought the fire. Mm, looking forward to that. Um, so we've said the fire started in 1666. Michelle asks, was that during the plague? Um, but the plague was mostly over by the time the Great Fire happened. So the, the Great Plague started in 1665. And while there were a few plague cases still happening in 1666, most of the plague was over by the time the fire started. Mm. And what else do we have? So Vicky says, was it common for fires to start in London in those days? Uh, well, there have been many very serious fires in London's history. Um, uh, in Roman times, in medieval times, and probably the one of the worst ones was in 1212 in the medieval period where um, over 3,000 people were um, estimated at the time to have died. So it was a really, really terrible fire. And after that, they put in regulations. So they banned thatch. So the sort of straw um, roofs of houses, they were banned and everyone had to have tiled roofs instead, which helped stop the spread of fires. So they, until from 1212 until 1666, there wasn't a really major fire, though of course fires did occur. Okay, well, so quite a while then. Yeah. Um, now you've mentioned thatch, but Amy Rose has a really good question. Um, why did they build the houses so close together? Uh, well, that was because um, London's sort of population were quite squashed inside the city walls. So the most old, the oldest part of London was inside the city walls and there were suburbs kind of spreading out around it. But there was, you know, thousands of people all trying to squash inside the city. So they built their houses close together to fit as many people in as possible. And with all those people, there must have been a lot of rubbish. Um, and Paul Caroline says, did the amount of rubbish spread spread around the streets, help to carry the fire fr from house to house? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure whether rubbish in particular, mind you, it may, it may have, have had a role. I mean, certainly the wind would sort of make bits, flaming bits fly through the air and then they would land on houses a few streets away, that kind of thing. So that would help the spread of the fire. Um, it was really they, windy wasn't it pardon it was very windy wasn't it it was i mean there was this yeah. huge storm blowing on um 
And the other thing was that when they were pulling down houses to make these breaks in the fire to stop it from spreading any further, um, sometimes they didn't do that quick enough and pull all the debris out of the way quick enough so the debris could catch on fire and then spread mm. even um, further on. So yeah, it was really hard to put it out. Hmm. A really great question then, very good. Um, a question a bit about context. So um, Fiona says, who was the king or queen when the great fire started? It was King Charles II. So he was king from 1660. So this is like the sixth year of his reign. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very worried about London. He got very involved in fighting the fire himself. Hmm. And another quite um, interesting question. So um, Ashin says, were all the streets named after food? All the streets named after food? After is that food. We've had Pudding Lane, haven't we? Oh, um, actually quite a lot of the streets in London were named after foods or where you could buy certain things. So Bread Street was a street where, which had bakeries on it. Um, cheap side, um, we probably don't have the same word for this now, but cheap meant market. Um, and so that was a street with lots of market stalls on it. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of old street names in London that relate to what was what you could buy there. Mm. Wonderful. Um, let me see if we've got any other questions here. So, how long did it take to put the fire out? Um, good question. I mean, they were fighting the fire from kind of Sunday or Sunday morning onwards, but the the kind of a real efforts to really put it out start on Tuesday and then the fire um, ends on sort of first thing on Thursday morning so it's about a day and a half when they're actually really putting um, the fire out and taking control over it. Mm. Oh so a fair amount of time then um, and how far did the fire spread? So the fire spread from the Tower of London across in, in the east across to temple in the west which is nearly two miles so it would take you about half an hour from walk to walk from one side of wow. the fire to the other so it's it's a huge area definitely okay i'm just waiting for some more questions to come through um do you have one for me marina uh, I do have one for you, Mariel. Um, so when I was young, I was always taught that the Great Fire um, ended the plague. Is that true? No, that's a myth. It's just, um, it's convenient timing. But actually, if you look at a map of London that shows you the areas that were worst hit by the plague, um, that it's a different area that burns in the Great Fire of London. So the myth is kind of that the fire cleanses the city and, and burns the plague away, but that's not the case because it's the plague is worse in the suburbs and that mm -hmm. is those are the areas that did not burn in the fire. Oh, okay, oh, that's very interesting. There you go. What I thought when I was young has, I've lost. Um, it's just a myth. <laughs> uh, we have a great question from Carly Buchanan. Um, back to how the fire started, why did the baker fall asleep whilst he was still cooking? Uh, well, he um, went to bed um, that night and he had sort of raked up his fires, but he had left a burning ember behind so that it was easy to start the fires again the next morning. Um, so it might be that a spark fell out of those burning embers perhaps but to be honest we don't really know exactly how the fire began we just know where it began mm. oh excellent um, and John says why do we call it the great fire oh uh, I guess because it's so huge um and it's like the great plague I mean actually the great plague is not the worst outbreak of plague in London's history but it's just the last one and the great fire was kind of the last huge fire until we get to the blitz in the 1940s ah so that's what gives it its name of great then um ah Lindsay has asked how do we know that the family jumped out of the window that night um, well, we've, there's a letter that survives from the time, um, which was written shortly after the fire by a guy called Sir um, Edward Harley, and he's writing to his wife. Um, 
and he's sort of describing um, all the latest news from London and he talks about how the fire begins and how the baker has to escape with his family and so on. So that's where that bit of information comes from. Mm, interesting. And I expect news like that spread quite quickly as well. That exactly. Thing. Yeah. Everybody in London would have been talking about how it began, who's lost what, and what bits of uh, burnt down and they're writing to their friends and relatives to tell them. Hmm. Oh, wonderful. Now we're getting so many questions. Um, this is fantastic. So one question, uh, these are about um, future, potentially future streams. So uh, perhaps you could answer quickly, Mariel. So where did people take shelter when the houses were on fire? Um, well, they fled out of the city and they set up kind of temporary camps in the fields outside the city. So there's some amazing descriptions in people's diaries from the time of thousands of Londoners sort of sitting by heaps of all their household belongings in the fields. Hmm. Sanhita, that was a great question. Um, and I think we will definitely address it in future, uh, future streams a little bit more as well. Um, and oh. We've also got another, so from Lindsay, she also asked, how do we know that the maid was too scared to jump out of the window? Um, that's also in that, that letter that I described by um, Edward Harley to his wife. So it talks about how yeah, the maid um, was too scared and, and um, was burnt in the house. Um, but Thomas Fariner, his daughter Hannah and their manservant were able to escape. But um, that same letter describes Hannah as being very scorched. So she must have got burnt herself, but mm -hmm. was able to escape. Must have been very scary. Yeah, totally terrifying. Um, another question. So how many buildings were destroyed by the fire? Uh, well, records from the time say that 13,200 houses died and um, died. I mean, burnt. Um, so, yeah, and, and 87 churches burnt down as well. Wow, so a huge swathe of London completely yeah. destroyed. Now, yeah, I about a quarter of the size of London at the time was burnt. Hmm. Now, I will get some more questions up. I'm then... Um, there's so many questions coming in that I'm needing to find them. So uh, this will be our very last question. Um, and so, Meryl, you are a curator. Really great question here from Frank. Um, what is your role as a curator? Um, I've got lots of different elements to my role. So a big part of it is um, working with colleagues about what we put on display in the museum, um, in the main galleries and also temporary exhibitions. So researching the collections and when you go into the museum and you see the labels that for all the objects, those are the sorts of things that um, curators write. So um, I write the text for temporary exhibitions. I um, research the objects in the collection. I do teaching. I help answer inquiries. So when people write to the museum and they've got questions about London history, I'm one of those people that replies to those questions. Um, yeah, it's a really varied job. It's really fun. It sounds like a great job. I'm very <laughs> jealous, Meryl. Now, now, sadly, that is all we have time to ask Meryl today. Uh, but thank you so much for all of your fantastic questions. Yes, they were really, really good questions. Now, we will do our best to answer all of the questions uh, that have come in on the Facebook comments, which we haven't been able to put to Meryl live. Uh, but Meryl will only be around until 3 p.m. on Facebook. And we've got one last thing for you. Um, after each of our live streams, we'll be setting a challenge um, about what we've learned in each one. So your challenge this time is to get drawing. So do you remember the reasons why the fire got so bad? Um, draw a picture of each of the reasons that you can think of. Um, can you draw more than three? And then um, show them to your friends and family and um, your classmates and see if you've got some of the same ones or different ones and share them with us as well. So um, if you want to share your pictures with us, please do, but make sure they're pictures that you've drawn yourself. And we really look forward to seeing them. And that's it. So thank you so much for joining us today and for all of the excellent questions and the thoughts that you've shared with us. You'll be able to find the challenge which Meryl has described, uh, plus watch the recording of today's stream and tell us what you thought of today's stream on the museum website. So that's museumoflondon.org.uk slash fire. 
We hope you'll join us again next week at the same time and you'll get a new tour and find out another part of the fire. Plus get another chance to ask questions to Meryl. Yeah, so next time it will be about what people did during the fire and how the fire was eventually put out. So we'll even have some exciting firefighting equipment to show you. So we can't wait to see you then. And if you've enjoyed it as much as we have today, remember to share it with your friends and family and to join us next time. Goodbye. Bye.